Yep. So I'll wait 15 seconds and I'll start talking. So hello everybody and welcome to our virtual earthworm biology talk. Uh, I'm Jenny, I work at the Ecology Centre in Holland Park and we've got Trevor here as well. In a second I'm going to hand over to Kieran from the Earthworm Society for the talk. The talk is going to be about an hour long with plenty of time for questions at the end. So if you have a question for Kieran make sure you send it in as you go along and I'll answer them at the end. We would like to thank the Friends of Holland Park for sponsorship of this talk and other online talks. We want to talk three of six now, so there's three more to go. You can find some information about those on our website. So I will hand over to Kieran now. Thank you. Hi there, so am I okay to go straight in now, yeah? Okay, right everybody, welcome to um, this earthworm biology talk um, that we're doing for Holland Park. Ecology Centre. I thought I'd start just for those that don't know me, um, explaining what my link with earthworms is. Um, although I'm going to be talking about earthworm biology today, that's really not my speciality. I, I started off uh, working with earthworms as a research assistant, a volunteer at the Natural History Museum, working for their soil biodiversity uh, group, and that involved working on um, earthworms and other soil invertebrates in the New Forest and Borneo as well, so two uh, very different woodlands there. Uh, from there I got involved with an organisation called the Earthworm Society of Britain and I'm currently the recording officer for the society which means I manage the national recording scheme and that's led to me being the national recorder for earthworms uh, for the Biological Record Centre for the UK. Um, in addition to that um, I for a some time now I've been an associate tutor for the Field Studies Council uh, where I teach earthworm courses mainly about identifying and recording earthworms rather than uh, their ecology and biology um, and I also work my day job is for the Field Studies Council working on the Biolinks project which is all about teaching people how to identify and record various groups of invertebrates including earthworms. Um, in my spare time, another role I have is I'm the chair of the Ecology and Entomology Committee for London Natural History Society, which includes being the um, local recorder for earthworms for London. And I'm also the Earthworm Society of Britain representative uh, with bug life as well. So I have a, quite a few different ro uh, roles with regards to earthworms. Um, and but the main one is really with the Earthworm Society of Britain. So for those who have not heard of it, the Earthworm Society of Britain is the uh, national society with regards to earthworms in the UK. Uh, our main focus is recording earthworms, so getting a picture of their distribution uh, and their abundance, as well as training people to identify earthworms and running talks like this, as well as training courses as well. Um, and I'll give you a link to the website at the end of the talk. OK, so I thought I'd start with what is an earthworm, just to make sure we're all on the same page and to filter out anybody that shouldn't really be here. <laughs> uh, so earthworm isn't actually a taxonomic um, group. And, and what I mean by a taxonomic group is, I mean, it, it's not it's not a strict term in, in terms of uh, categorising uh, animals. It's actually the common name for the largest members of oligarchites in the phylum Annelida. So um, annelids are segmented segmented worms and it it's really a grouping of several different families of uh, segmented worm. So I'll explain that I'll explain that in a minute but the annelids, the segmented worms, uh, they include many things, inclu including a lot of marine species called polychaete, wor uh, the polychaete worms, including freshwater species, other so soil worms as well that are similar to earthworms. Uh, but what, one of their most famous relatives is really uh, the leeches. So here we've got a picture on the left of a leech that I found um, at Malantan up in Yorkshire when I was looking for earthworms. And to the right, is a earthworm that I found on the River Thames in Goring on Thames. And as you can see, superficially they look very similar. They've both got that seg they're both segmented. Um, they also both um, 
have the the saddle feature that you can see on the uh, foam there uh, the you can't see it on the leech there but leeches do have it as well the main difference between a, an earthworm and a leech really is their mouth parts and their diet that's a that's a big a big telltale sign between the two so um when we think about earthworms in the grand scheme of things in terms of where they fit in the animal kingdom i put a diagram here on the far right that shows the different kingdoms that you get within um, within the animal plant and fungi bacteria the living world so earthworms are animals so they belong to the kingdom animalia and on the left hand side you've got a table here that gives an example species of an earthworm the brandling worm or tiger worm which is commonly found in compost and uh, on the right hand side you've got a tiger and by that I mean tiger as in the big cat rather than the tiger earthworm and I just brought this table so that you can see how when we're going down the, the table how, how it's categorized so you don't need to know this in any detail but just to let you know when we're talking about earthworms we're talking about a group of families so the equivalent in the um, in the mammal um, class would be talking about a group of families like maybe cats and dogs and foxes, something like that, uh, grouping all them together. OK, so that's where they fit in the in the taxonomy of things. But when we're describing what an earthworm is, I think it's much easier to actually go back to the word. Uh, it tells us a lot about, about what we mean by an earthworm. So the word earth, can mean one of two things. It can be the planet on which we live, the world, um, which doesn't really narrow it down when we're thinking of organisms, because all living organisms that we're aware of live on the world, live on the planet. So, or it can mean the substance of the land, the land surface, the soil. So when we're talking about earthworms, obviously we're thinking about things that live um, that, that are related to soil. A worm can be any number of creeping or burrowing invertebrate animals with long slender soft bodies and no limbs or it can be a weak or despicable person often often used as a general term of abuse so uh, here we're talking about um, obviously the first rather than the latter um, and what i've done here is uh, so this this is some examples of worms so they're not all earthworms um, I wondered if you want to have a go at guessing, please feel free to drop your answers in the chat. But have a look at this and have a think about how many of these you think are actually earthworms. So I'll give you a couple of seconds to have a look and then I'll let you know what the answer is. Um, but yeah, some of these are earthworms and some of these are other type of worms. You may know what type of worms they are or you, or you may be a little bit unsure. but. Have a think. If you want to put your answer in the chat, feel free to feel free to drop it there. And right, okay. So the actual answer there is that there are three earthworms, um, and there are three other type of worms. So going from top left to right, and then bottom left to right, we've got a leech. Um, we've got an earthworm in the middle at the top there and at the right at the top that's another type of earthworm the bottom left is one of those polychaete worms i was talking about that's a bobbit worm that you sometimes uh, find in aquarium in the bottom of the tank of aquariums uh, and they'll be coming out and eating the fish if they're there so you don't want a bobbit worm in your in your fish tank um bottom center is another type of earthworm so that's our third and the one on the the worm on the bottom right hand side is a slow worm which is obviously not an earthworm it's a lizard a legless lizard okay so moving on i think one of the first things i'd like to teach you about earthworm biology is, is a good lesson when it comes to anatomy earthworms will have a feature or they, or they may have a feature called a saddle which is the one indicated by the yellow arrow there now this is a feature that is used in reproduction um, and we'll go into that in a little bit more detail in a second, but it's just good to be aware of it because the saddle tells us two things about an earthworm. The first thing it tells us is which end is the head. So the saddle is always closest to the head end of the earthworm. So it tells us that this pointer end on this, this specimen is actually the head end and the rounder, lighter coloured 
end is the um, tail end. Now, obviously, when you're digging up your garden and you find earthworms, there's always a chance that you've, you've chopped an earthworm with your spade. So the exception to the rule is when the earthworm has been damaged. So the second thing a saddle uh, or patellum, as it's known, tells us about an earthworm is whether it's a juvenile or an adult. So earthworms are not actually born with the saddle. Um, they're, it's something they develop when they reach sexual maturity. So the presence of a saddle tells us that this is an adult or sexually mature earthworm. If you find an earthworm that doesn't have a saddle, that means that it's um, a juvenile. OK, so that's earthworm anatomy 101. Moving on, I've got another question for you here. And again, feel free to drop your answer in the chat. Um, or feel free to, to just privately have a guess. I want, I want you to take a second, have a look at this earthworm. We can see it's an adult because we can see it's got an orange saddle there. Um, and the saddle, um, yeah, is that orange bit there. I'd like you to just have a think, is this an earthworm? Is this earthworm male or female? So have a think whether you think it's male or female and drop your answer in the chat. I'll give you a couple of seconds to do that before I move on and before I explain the answer. OK, right. Well, for those for those who guessed male, you're right. For those who guessed female, you're also right, because actually it's both. Um, so Earthworms are, are what we call hermaphrodite um, organisms, and, and that means they're both male and female. So they have both the reproductive organ, uh, parts, organs of a male and a female. Um, we actually refer to them as simultaneous hermaphrodites, meaning that, that when, they, when they mate as well, both parties will play the part of both the male and the female. So during sexual intercourse, both sets of sex organs will be used by both worms and if all goes well both of the mates become fertilized all right okay so earthworms are hermaphrodite organisms so here i've got um, a diagram of the earthworm life cycle and i'm going to go through that step by step and just explain it explain it to you OK, so the life cycle, like many others, starts with an egg and an egg. Within the egg, a, an earthworm, a young earthworm will develop until it's ready to hatch. The egg is encased in an egg casing that we actually call a cocoon. Um, so here you've got a picture of some earthworm cocoons. The number of eggs within one cocoon can vary between species. And that will range from between one and 20 from the species in the family Lumbricidae. Um, but most species will just have one. Uh, the cocoons tend to be lemon shaped um, and the, uh, the specific shape can vary between species and it can actually be used to identify um, species. Although I have to hold my hands up and admit that that's not a skill that I currently have. It's something I'd like to learn more about. And the amount of time that they take to hatch varies between species um, and also environmental conditions. So, for example, for some species, the cocoons may hatch quicker in warmer conditions and in cooler conditions. And other, worm, uh, other species may wait out undesirable drought conditions within the soil as the cocoon's danger. We'll mention that a little bit later. So, Moving on from the cocoon stage, when the earthworm's ready to hatch from there, you'll get what we call hatchlings, and they look like just like mini earthworms. They're just smaller and paler. Um, it can be easy to confuse these with um, a related group that we call um, potworms or enchytraeids, and they're small segmented worms that are, that are closely related. Like I said, they're another type of annelid. Um, so as the hatchling feeds and grows, it will gain, it will become the colour of the adult earthworm and it will become a juvenile earthworm. So the image that you can see now 
that is an earthworm juvenile. It looks just like an adult. The only difference is that it doesn't actually have the saddle, the clitellum that I mentioned earlier on that you used during reproduction. Um, one thing to be aware of is juveniles, the size of a juvenile, the size is not, the size of a British earthworm does not necessarily relate to whether it's a juvenile or not, because we have many different species. So those different species come in different sizes, different shapes, different colours. So a juvenile of one species may be way bigger than even an adult of another. So that's so it's always about whether there's a saddle there or not. Right, so as the, the juveniles uh, grow, they'll eventually uh, reach full size and have a fully developed clitellum and the rest of the sexual organs that they have um, as an adult. And when they when they're adults, they'll start looking for a mate. Um, as we mentioned, they're simultaneous hermaphrodites, so they'll mate, they'll mate together with another earthworm. And what they'll tend to do is come out of their burrows at night, find another earthworm, and they'll essentially sit for, uh, form a 69 position uh, where they line up. Um, so the two earthworms produce what we call a slime tube and they grip onto each other using a feature called the tubercular pubertatis, which is a feature that's located on the saddle. The slime tube provides the right environment for the two earthworms to exchange sperm, with each earthworm storing the sperm of its partner for later, for use later. Because both earthworms are performing the function of both a male and female during sexual reproduction, again, we call that simultaneous hermaphrodite. Um, following this, sperm exchange between the, the earth, uh, following the sperm exchange between the earthworms, they'll separate. Um, I should probably point out this at this point that not not all reproduction in earthworms does take place sexually. Asexual reproduction can also un be undertaken by some species of earthworm, and this involves just a single earthworm producing young from un fertilized eggs. And the scientific term for that process is parthenogenesis. Okay, so whether the earthworm has reproduced sexually or asexually, the next step is a mucus sheath will form around the clitellum and that will move along the earthworm until it comes a head end. Along that journey, it picks up the eggs from the it picks up its own eggs, its own unfertilized eggs and the sperm that it's stored from the earthworm that it's had sex with. And the mucus sheath will come off the egg, the tip of the earthworm's head and both ends will pinch and that will form the cocoon. So that's why we get the lemon shape of the cocoon and the fertilized eggs will be within there. I'm sure there'll be lots of questions about earthworm reproduction. I'll try and clarify them at the end when we have the question and answer session. OK, right, to give my voice a tiny little break, I thought I'd ask a question to you, you guys. And again, either just jot down on a piece of paper or answer in the chat. If you cut an earthworm in half, do you think both halves survive independently? So we've all heard this, um, this information passed down by relatives and friends. The expression that if you cut an earthworm in half, you'll end up with two worms. So have a think about it. Jot down on a piece of paper in the chat. And then um, in just a moment, I'll give you the answer to that. So if you cut an earthworm in half, will both halves survive independently? OK, the answer to that is actually false. Um, so earthworms have most of their important organs at the head end of the body. So generally, if you cut an earthworm between the saddle and the head, both ends of the earthworm, earthworm will die as they'll both be missing vital organs. And I'll, I'll show you those organs that they have in that end in a diagram um, in a couple of slides. Um, however, if you do chop the earthworm in half between the saddle and the tail, there is a chance that the earthworm might survive. It might not. Um, 
because it is still damaged, it is to still harm the earthworm. But earthworms have actually been shown to harbour amazing regenerative powers and regrow posterior segments that are lost because uh, they do lose that, not just through people gardening, but also through predation. Um, what I've got here is an image of an earthworm that was found by my fellow earthworm um, Society of Britain recorder, Dr Frank Ashwood. And what this image shows is that at the very tail end, you've got the tail growing back. So you can see it, it initially grows back um, smaller in terms of um, thickness and it will, it will keep growing until it, it looks a bit more like it did originally. So that's a good example of an earthworm showing regenerative properties. Um, we've mentioned about them losing their tails through predation, but earthworms can actually lose their tails by choice. So like lizards and other organisms, when they face um, a threatening situation such as predation, sometimes earthworms will lose their tail, they'll drop their tail. Um, we call this autotomy um, as a process, and it, yeah, it's the process of the earthworm losing their tail. It won't always grow back exactly how it was. It depends on, on the um, age, health and species of earthworm, how able it's, it is to do that. And to my knowledge, not all earthworm species can necessarily um, perform this behaviour, so it might be limited to some species. OK, so moving on. So I mentioned that I'd tell you what organs the earthworm has within that head end. Um, and I think it's always quite interesting to look at earthworm uh, organs because they have a lot of similar similarities to organisms that we're more familiar with that you might not think. So earthworms are quite different to a lot of other invertebrates in that they have a circulatory system that uses um, haemoglobin, so it uses blood. So they have some similarities to um, vertebrates like mammals, like ourselves. They have what we call pseudo hearts. So these are not hearts in the same way that we have a heart, but they're a thicken thickening of the blood vessel that is used to pump um, blood around the earthworm's uh, circulatory system. Their circulatory system is much less complex than ours, um, but you do get blood flowing from one end of the earthworm to another. Um, so these pseudo hearts pump that blood round, and like I said, it contains haemoglobin, which is very different from other invertebrates, but it does it mean that when you cut an earthworm and it bleeds, you will actually notice that it, its blood is red. So um, and that's because of the haemoglobin that they use to um, get oxygen out of out of the air. So that's one feature that they have that's similar to us. Another feature that I think is quite interesting is that they have a crop and a gizzard. So if we think about what earthworms eat, they eat lots of quite difficult to digest and difficult to chew um, material. Unlike us, they don't have teeth to grind this up. Um, so like birds, they have what we call a crop and a gizzard. And these areas are used to process that food. The crop is sat like and it, it, um, it receives the food and the gizzard is a hard and muscular um, part that is used to grind it. So earthworms are known to eat actually um, things as hard as stones um, and that might be eating grit might help them grind up the other things that they're eating like um, leaves and soil etc. So I think that's quite interesting as well. Um, apart from that, another interesting uh, organ that they have is within the muscular part of the, the very tip of the head, they've got a pin-sized brain. They've also got an esophagus and a pharynx. Um, but most of an earthworm really is the digestive system. So most of an earthworm is a big long gut. Okay. So another question for you all, flooding can kill earthworms as they drown in the waterlogged soils. Is that true or false? So have a think about it. Can flooding kill earthworms as they drown in the waterlogged soils? So I'll give you, I'll give you just a minute to have a think about that. Okay. 
So it does flood in killer ferns by drowning them in the waterlogged soils. Okay. Okay, the answer to this, this was a little bit of a trick question. It was a little bit of a mean one, if I'm honest. Uh, it's false. So earthworms actually respire. So they can breathe in, they, they, they can respire in water. They can breathe in water because they breathe through their skin and they actually require moisture to be able to do so. So a big danger to earthworms is drying out. Um, so they need that layer of moisture on their skin. Some species will actually thrive in waterlogged soils. So we have a couple of species that you'll only find when it's really, really wet. Uh, and earthworms can survive for several weeks underwater. The reason it's a bit of a trick question is that flooding can kill earthworms, just not through drowning. So the way you can kill them is um, if the water becomes deoxygenated, de so all the oxygen is gone from the water because over time, uh, earthworms and other, other organisms that require oxygen from the water take all the oxygen out of that water, the earthworms can actually suffocate. So they don't drown, they suffocate. Um, but it's actually thought that earthworm populations are able to cover relatively quickly from floods as the next generation of earthworms can wait out these conditions in um, their cocoons. Uh, so when we're thinking about uh, earthworm respiration, uh, like I said, um, they need to be moist. So mucus glands in the epidermis and the skin keep the body moist. Respiration occurs through the moist body surface. So they're not be breathing through their mouth, they're breathing through their, um, through their skin. Um, oxygen dissolves through the cuticle, epidermis and thin walls of the blood vessels and haemoglobin from that circulatory system uh, in the blood takes up the oxygen and transports it around the body. So um, that's how they respire. Um, we mentioned the um, earthworm earlier about earthworms uh, waiting out difficult conditions in their cocoon stage. Um, but what other defences do earthworms have for when the environmental conditions are not great? So they need it fairly moist, um, but they also don't want it, um, yeah, so it, it can't be too dry. Uh, there are other conditions that can be quite detrimental for earthworms where the ground's frozen um, or it's it's a bit too cold. So what earth, another mechanism earthworms have for coping with unfavourable soil conditions are to go into a state, to, so another um, ecology, uh, behavioural response they have is what we call diapause. So diapause is when the earthworm will go into a state of torpor, so they'll slow down their metabolism, they knot themselves into a ball like you can see in the image on the screen and that allows them to reduce their mat metabolic rate a lot. Now this diapause can be one of two forms, so there is hibernation which is a state of state of torpor during the winter periods and um, so they go into hibernation in winter when the ground is maybe frozen so they go down and they um, tie themselves in a, knot, a little bit deeper in the soil to escape the conditions and um, if it's a bit dry in summer uh, we call that estivation so estivation is it, it's basically a form of diapause so it's like a, a summer hibernation so winter is hibernation summer is Estivation and they're all types of diapods. Okay, so that's a, a bit about earthworm biology. What I wanted to talk a little bit now is a little bit about earthworm ecology as well. So, what does this biology mean? So, if we go back in time, uh, Aristotle, for back in 322 to 384 BC, um, is quoted as saying that earthworms were the intestines of the earth. So it was recognised at quite an early point that earthworms were quite important. Um, if we fast forward in time to, uh, to 1777, in one of his correspondences, the famous naturalist Gilbert White said, earthworms, though in appearance a small and despicable link in the chain of nature, yet if lost would make a lamentable chasm. Um, I actually take a little bit of umbrage to this um, quote because I wouldn't call them a despicable link in the cha chain of nature. I think they're quite a beautiful um, link, but 
at least he's recognizing that they were important. However, despite this, Gilbert White didn't really do, didn't really talk about earthworms very much. He didn't study them very much and, and not many people did. It wasn't until a fellow called Charles Darwin came along you know, that we, that earthworms were really put on the map about yeah, and how important they were. So Gilbert Weiss also quoted as saying that we needed a um, we needed some publications on earthworm that explained how important they were. And the person who did that was actually Charles Darwin. So in 1881, he published a uh, book called The Formation of Vegetable Mold Through the Action of Worms, where he, he publishes work on earthworm ecology um, and behavior. And it's a fascinating read, I highly recommend it. But if you want a if you want a brief summary of what he found, my fellow my fellow earthworm state of Britain recorder Kerry Calloway actually presented a live talk for um, the Field Studies Council on Darwin's earthworms, and that talk is available to watch for free on YouTube, um, and you can find out about. There's a link to that on the Earthworm Society of Britain under our news section. So you just go to their website and look at the news section. Right, OK, so earthworms, how many species of earthworms do we have in the British Isles? So this is something to just have a think about. Quite often it's something that people haven't thought about before. So just have a think how many species that you think we've got in the UK. Dot down on a piece of paper, put it in the chat, have a think. So just in the UK, Roughly, ballpark figure, how many species have we got? I'll give you a clue, it's more than one. Um, so, yeah, have a think about it. Right, the actual answer, in the British Isles, we've got 31 species. Um, in the UK, we've only got 29 recorded species, because we have two species that have been found in Ireland, but not in the rest of the British Isles. Um, and that includes Northern Ireland. I don't think they've ever been recorded in the northern part, uh, Northern Ireland, part of the island of Ireland. So, um, yeah, we actually have 31 different species, which may surprise some of you, um, because 31 um, may seem a lot, but for an invertebrate group, that's actually actually a relatively small number of um, species. And if you go to other parts of the world, um, there's quite often a lot more than that. So we're quite lucky in the UK if we want to identify British species, you can do that um, by looking at an earthworm under a microscope. Unfortunately, you do have to go out, collect them and preserve them. So you do have to kill them to be able to see the features that you need. Um, you do need a microscope to do that. So it means that they're not the most accessible group for looking at for unless you're going to go into a bit more detail um, but the rest of the world you normally need to actually dissect them and look at their internal organs because earthworms don't have a lot of uh, features externally that allow you to separate them out to the different species um, the earthworm site we teach a lot more about this um, i've got an image up on the screen that shows you the kind of features and how you would need to um, that you would need to identify an earthworm it often involves uh, looking at very very small features, but also counting segments as to where features appear. Um, but with the Earthworm Society, in partnership with the Field Studies Council, we've come up with a series of courses that will get people um, skilled enough to be able to identify earthworms. Now, those courses are currently on hold because of COVID-19, but we expect to start them again next year. Um, and we may be launching an online training course that um, introduces and expands on some of the things that I'm talking about today. OK, so moving on and, and sticking with the theme of ecology, I'm going to briefly go through the different types of earthworm that you get in the UK. So we've got 31 different species, but you can broadly group them into four ecological groups. Uh, these four ecological groups so there's three on this diagram here, um, plus another one, Epiendo and J, but we're not going to talk about this, that today. Uh, we also see in the UK, we've got a fourth group, um, compost earthworms, which I'll explain in a second. Um, the thing to think about with these different groupings is they've been grouped based on morphological, so 
features that they have, so anatomical features that they have. They've been, the groupings also relate to their ecology and they also relate to their, where they occur in the in a vertical cross section of the ground. So you get them right from deep down in the soil through to actually living on the surface. So I'm going to give you a whistle stop tour of those four different ecological groups uh, before moving on. If you want to hear a bit more depth about that, I actually did a talk specifically on earthworm ecology um, for the Field Studies Council. And again, that's available to watch on YouTube. OK, so the four different groups that we've got in the UK, four different ecological groups or ecotypes, as I'm going to refer to them from now on, are anisic, meaning um, deep burrowing, endogeic, meaning shallow burrowing, epigeic, meaning um, on the surface, and compost, which surprise, surprise, means you get them in compost heaps and other um, habitats with high organic content. OK, so the first of those are the anisic earthworms. I'm going to start deep down and work my way up to the surface and above ground species. So anisic earthworms are deep burrowing earthworms. They live in deep vertical burrows, but they do actually come to the surface at night to feed and mate. Um, they feed on soils and leaves, so they have a, a mixed mixed diet and their dark red dorsally often darker towards the head end. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail about these um, features for identifying them because I go through them in that other talk that's available on YouTube. Uh, they're also relatively large in size so the anisic earthworms are our biggest earthworms in the UK. Um, a feature of one of the or two of the species that we've got in the UK, the lobworm, known as Lumbricus terrestris and a rarer earthworm uh, called Lumbricus friendi is their ability to build middens. Uh, so middens are these structures that they build to um, block up the surface of their burrows because anisic earthworms will reuse their burrows, they have a permanent burrow system. So they'll have more than one entrance and exit but um, they'll reuse their burrows and come out at night and go back in uh, during during daylight hours. So these um, lob worms, um, or common earthworms as they're known, uh, will plug the burrows up with sticks, stones, anything they can find really. And Darwin actually did quite a lot of um, work on these. I don't know if you've been able to spot the four middens in the image, but these are a telltale sign that you've got anisic earthworms on your lawn or, or wherever you can find them. Um, so there's a midden there with the red circle around it. You should be able to see it. There's one there and then there's two there. So the two middens in that photo together shows you how far apart the earthworms will build their, build their middens. And it, it tends to be the perfect distance for coming out at night and mating with another earthworm while keeping your tail anchored in your burrow so that if a predator comes along or something comes along and disturbs you, you can shoot back in your burrow fairly um, fairly easily. OK, um, another sign of anisic earthworms in your lawn are these earthworm casts. Uh, so earthworm casts are another term for earthworm poo and they'll de be deposited on the surface. So when we say these anisic earthworms are feeding on soil from deep down and they're eating um, leaves from the surface, that will all mix in their gut and these really, really nutrient rich casts will be laid on the surface. Um, so these, this is a great way of ploughing the earth naturally and uh, providing that really nutrient rich topsoil. So in addition to composting, this is a, a great way of ensuring that the the top layer of the soil is, is well fertilised and a natural process for doing that. Okay, so yeah, so that's the anisic earthworms. So moving up through the soil profile now, getting closer to the surface, we've got what we call the endogeic earthworms, the shallow burrowing earthworms. Now these live in horizontal burrows in soil, in the top soil layers, the upper soil layers. They will reuse their burrows, but they'll also be constantly creating new ones. So they don't use their burrow system in as permanent a fashion 
as the anaesthetic earthworms. They rarely come to the surface. The exception to this really is during rain, um, where you'll find them quite often in abundance. The reason they do this is because uh, it's easier for them to disperse on the surface during the rain because they can breathe, they can keep moist. Um, unfortunately, when they come across paved areas like roads, quite often the sun will come out and they dry out quite quickly. So if you see an earthworm drying up on the road, uh, you should pick it up and put it somewhere where, where it can get back into the soil. Um, it means it's got caught out and obviously it's easy prey for uh, birds um, if it's if it's on the drying out on the surface. Um, the endogenics, like I've said, seem to do this a lot. Um, and one of the telltale signs that it's an endogenic earthworm is they'll quite often have a, a really pale colour. Um, the way I like to think of it is like a sun tan analogy. The more exposure they have with the outside world, the more tanned they are, the darker they are. So the anaesthetics, you might remember, have a dark red head, they have a paler tail, that's because they'll keep that tail anchored. Um, so yeah, I, whereas the endogenics, they rarely come to the surface, so they're often quite pale and, and often quite sickly looking colours. So you get brown, grey, blue, all sorts of colours that, that um, but yeah, quite often quite pink and, and things. So if you see an earthworm after it's rained on the surface and it looks like it's quite sickly colours, that, that might mean it's an endogenic. They're usually a medium to large size and some of the bigger ones can actually be, um, give the anaesthetic earthworms a run for their money in terms of thickness and size. Um, Right, so moving on up through the soil profiles, right, we've got the, the endogenics in the top layer of the soil. If we go above that to the surface, we've then got the epigenic earthworms, which are the surface dwelling earthworms. These are earthworms that live in the leaf litter, dung and deadwood. So they're not feeding on the soil, these ones. Uh, they're feeding on decaying plant matter such as leaf litter and rotting logs. So, rotting logs. So this is in contrast to the endogenics, which were feeding almost in, yeah, basically purely on soil. These li these live purely on the decaying plant matter. Um, a habitat where you'll find all three of these um, ecotypes quite often is if you lift a log. Um, you quite often will get all of them resting underneath it. So that's a good place to look for the different types. The way, when we look at the colour, they're really, they've got a dark, deep red head. And again, like the anaesthetic earthworms, they'll often get a bit lighter as you can get towards the end of the earthworm, the tail end. So how do you tell an epigeic from an anaesthetic earthworm? It's really all about size. Epigeics tend to be very small. If you think about it, if you're living above the surface, just in uh, plant matter, things like that, and you're an earthworm, which doesn't really have a lot of defensive uh, mechanisms, they're not toxic, uh, they're not poisonous, they, they don't have venom, they don't have teeth, they don't have spikes, so they don't really have much to defend themselves. So you want to be smaller in size, you want to be a bit more inconspicuous. A big earthworm living above the ground is easy prey for many, many predators. So you can't really tell from this picture, but epigeics and anaesthetics are very different in size, and that's a telltale sign. So this is a, a picture of an epigeic earthworm in the deadwood. So you'll quite often get them in a deadwood habitat like this, as you can see there. Right, so that's our epigeic earthworms. Moving on to the fourth ecological group or ecotype, we've got the compost earthworms. And really these are a subset of the epigeic earthworms, but they are a little bit different in that you really only find them in epigeic habitats where you've got extremely high organic content um, and they, they specialise in these high organic matter um, habitats. So you get them in compost bins um, and they'll, they'll um, colonise those naturally, so even if you don't introduce them, they seem to find them. And I have no idea how they do this, because you don't generally find them, um, well, you don't find them easily in the in the soil, so I don't know how, where they come from, how they find it. But in in, the, in natural environments, you'll find them um, 
under or in dung and in really rotten deadwood when it's in those later stages of decay. Uh, so again, usually found above ground, rarely found in the soil. When you find them in the soil, sometimes it is beneath those really high organic matter um, habitats. Um, and they're again, a dark red colour, but the difference between these and the other epigeic um, species is that they have this stripy appearance. So as you can see here, th this one has got a very stripy um, appearance. And one of the species, the um, Asenia fetida, which is known as a branding worm, also has an, the other name, the tiger worm. I mean, that, that can be a little bit misleading because other compost species also have this stripy appearance. So they could easily um, easily be mistaken for the tiger worm because they, they, look, they have this stripy appearance as well. Um, unlike other epigeic earthworms, they tend to be a medium to large size, so they tend to be a bit bigger, but there is certainly an overlap um, in terms of size between the epigeic and the compost earthworm. So a small compost earthworm will could be a similar size to one of the larger epigeics. Okay, so moving on from um, earthworms now, I want to talk to you very briefly about uh, another type of worm. Uh, and that is flatworms. So flatworms are, can, can be a predator of earthworms. And in the UK, that's not too much of a problem normally, but we do have a number of species that are not native to the UK. And we call these non-native invasive um, land flatworms. So a couple to be aware of, I'm just going to raise this very quickly, are the New Zealand flatworm, which surprise, surprise, is from New Zealand. Um, and that can follow an earthworm down its burrow. So unlike many natural predators like badgers um, or uh, beetles and, and lots of other things that feed on earthworms, it can actually follow a, an anesthetic earthworm down its burrow. So there's no escape for them. And there is anecdotal evidence that where you've got New Zealand flatworms, the, the earthworm population seem to have been fairly decimated. Um, then you've got the, here you've got Obama Nungara, which is a, its common name is the Obama flatworm. And that's a relatively recent introduction to the UK. It originates from Brazil. Uh, and it's a threat to native European earthworms in France. It's only been found a couple of times in the UK, first time in a garden centre in Oxfordshire. And then it was found in Guernsey um, in 2008. But yeah, it's now known to spread into France and into Spain. So a handful of locations in the UK. Um, and a third one to be aware of is the Australian flatworm. Uh, the Australian flatworm, where it's found, is very, very common. It seems to, you'll get loads of them, basically. And that's spread throughout the north, uh, not the northwest, sorry, the southwest of England. So it's, it's fairly common in gardens within the southwest. And again, that will... Um, that will predate on earthworms. Um, it's thought that the diet is solely earthworms and it, it, can, it can affect the earthworm population structure um, within a habitat because it, it, some species seem to be more affected than others. So the reason I'm bringing these three earthworms up are um, in, in a couple of weeks, um, so on the 10th of August, we've actually got Craig McAdam from Bug Life giving us a talk on a, a, um, a citizen science project they've got called Pot Watch, which is all about trying to find these, uh, look at, keeping an eye out when you're buying gar uh, garden centre plants um, for these non-native flatworms and submitting your records of them where they are found so that we can monitor where these are popping up. So this is not managed by the Earthworm Society of Britain, it's managed by Bug Life, but the Earthworm Society of Britain uh, support the project, we help promote it because these are a real threat to um, British species and I think personally that they're going to be a threat that grows, particularly if we don't want it to do anything about it. The New Zealand flatworm was in the UK for quite some time before it started spreading. Uh, it might be that climate change enables the spread of these species even more because they, they all come from uh, environments where, apart from the New Zealand flatworm, uh, the Australian and the Brazilian, the, the Brazilian species I mentioned come from 
environments are a bit warmer than um, the UK. So yeah, something we definitely need to keep an eye on. It will be a fascinating talk and I highly recommend it. Like this talk is free, uh, but you do need to book to get the details to log on. Uh, and you can find details of that just by Googling uh, FSC virtual meetups. Um, but if anyone needs the details, then um, I can I can make those available if you email the Earth from site. You've been. Right, so I didn't want to end on flatworms. So I thought what I'd end with is just, uh, I thought I'd step outside of the UK and let you know that Earthworms outside of the UK are a bit more varied and a, a bit different. The picture you've got here is actually a picture of the biggest earthworm in the UK, uh, not in the UK, in the world, and that's um, Australis, uh, Megascoloides australis, otherwise known, commonly known as the giant gypsum earthworm. Um, it is an endangered species, but it's a wonderful organism that can grow over two metres in length. So imagine that an earthworm that can grow over two metres in length. It's a real giant. Um, and the reason I brought it up is because to highlight the fact that earthworm science is still in its infancy. So unlike uh, groups like birds where we have so much information with earthworms, we really don't know that much. And the final picture I've got up here, is, the final diagram is um, a map of the world showing how well how well listed the um <laughs> sorry a j is just coming my garden with an earthworm when it's big how ironic <laughs> um yeah so it's earthworm earthworm checklist across the world and as you can see there there are m massive parts of the uh, globe there that really don't have much in terms of earthworm checklist so the brown areas are completely uncharted territories so if you've got any uh, rel young relatives coming up we should be telling them to go and go and study earthworms because uh, there's still so much that we need to know this is kind of a get out clause for the difficult questions that I'm sure that are coming uh, we've got a lot of information on the earthworm site here at Britain website so uh, the web address is up there uh, there's lots more information and I try and update and put more information on regularly. So yeah, on that note, I'm going to end the talk um, and go over to Trevor for the nice, easy questions that I hope have been coming through um, in, the, uh, in the chat. Excellent. So I'm actually going to go ahead with the questions. There's some good ones here for you. First one's come from Susan. Whenever I see an earthworm drowning in a puddle, I pick it up and put it in the grass. Is this the right thing to do? I don't want to cause them any harm. So if the puddle is in the grass, I wouldn't worry too much about it. Like I said, they'll actually use um, wet environments for cover. If it's, if it's in a puddle on the road, then I would uh, I would move it. it it's it's going to, well, when the puddle dries out, it's going to get trapped. Um, it's going to dry out and it's going to be easy prey for things like that jay that I just saw in my garden taking an earthworm. <laughs> I would say it depends where the where the puddle is. If it's on a substrate where the earthworm can get back into the ground, uh, leave it be. If it's uh, if it's in a puddle um, on a concrete hard surface where the earthworm can't burrow down, it might be worth rescuing it. Okay, so our next question sort of covered, but maybe you could run through it again. What is the longest recorded earthworm in length? So in the UK, I, do, I don't think I mentioned in the UK, our record mm. is 40 centimetres. And we've had 40 centimetres in two locations. So it's that uh, Lumbricus terrestris, the lob earthworm, and that's been on the Isle of Rome and, the, and in Cheshire as well. So we've had big chunky earthworms that are quite long found in those two locations. However, if we go further afield, the longest recorded earthworm is I just have between two and three meters. That's that's all all I've got. So that I, I yeah, I don't know what the official record is, but it's over two meters. However, there is a get out clause there, and that, that is the longest recorded specimen. There have been earthworm casts found in the Amazon in Brazil, 
that are huge and the earthworm species that create those casts have never been found and these these casts are bigger than a, an adult hand if you put your hand next to it they're, they're bigger than that so there is the possibility that we still have bigger earthworms out there than we currently know and there are quite there are a couple of earthworm scientists that are actually out there looking for bigger earthworms than the two meters there's a a Polish lady that lives in South Africa that is that believes that in Africa they've got this, they've got earthworms that are bigger than that and you've got a couple of American scientists that have been looking in the Amazon for um, for species that are bigger than uh, the giant gypsum and earthworm in um, in um, Australia so the jury's out as to whether that is the biggest that we've got and I think that's wonderful because for many groups you, they can be fairly confident that the the species that they think is the biggest probably is but with earthworms because they live underground there's still a lot of uh, there's still a lot of unknown I should have probably commented as well on that map where I pointed out how well recorded Brazil was down as is fairly well recorded. I think we've got good lists for Brazil, but I don't think the country is um, anywhere near as comprehensive a species list as what we've got in, in the UK and across most of Europe. Um, so Europe tends to be the best area for, for knowing what we've got. Okay, sorry, I went off a little bit of a tangent there, Jenny. <laughs> no, that was fine. You answered a lot of questions there. But the next one. Fishermen say worms don't feel anything when you put them on a hook. Is it true? Um, well, they do have a pin-sized brain, so they do have a, a nervous system of kinds. I don't know what earthworms can and can't feel. However, they they have shown, shown some intelligence and they do react to certain stimulus. So they don't like being picked up, for example. Um, they start drying out. They, yeah, they. Uh, if you if you poke right you can entice earthworms out of the ground through um, a number of different methods when they start coming out of the ground if you touch their head they'll shoot straight back down um, so they they do respond to certain st stimulus i can imagine being impaled on a hook would be something that, that they would react to they also react to light so if you shine a torch on earthworms at night although they don't have eyes they can sense light so you shine a torch on it and the earthworm will retreat back into its burrow again so I I would say I can't say for certain that fishermen are wrong but I'd like to see the evidence that backs that up um, yeah um, one thing I will mention is when fishermen are using earthworms that are not from the country that they're fishing in so for example in the states they use British species, European species a lot. They use them in the Great Lake area. And an impact of that is that our species are now non-native invasive species in those areas. So before you put your worm on a fishing hook, there are a few things to consider, not just whether the earthworm can feel it, but whether if that earthworm gets into the natural environment or when you're dumping your bait, for example, are there other impacts that there could be as well. Mm, that's a very good point. Um, so the next question here is from John. When would an earthworm self-fertilise as opposed to finding a mate? Um, I don't know how much evidence there is on this, John, but from what I gather, some species seem to do it a lot more than others. So there's a species, um, for example, Octalasian lactium. It doesn't have a common name, sorry. Um, and I've read that that tends to quite commonly um, reproduce through uh, parthenogenesis. So it might be that you might find quite a few individuals in a specific area, but they might all uh, stem from the same earthworm. Um, there are there are other species that I can't say for certain do it that I have a hunch do it um, because when I found them they like every earthworm seems very similar within a given area but then if I sample somewhere else the earthworms 
for that species will look a little different somewhere else. They won't be as uniform, but they'll all be uniform again, just in a slightly different way. So somebody would need to do a good genetic analysis on that, which is outside of my area of expertise. But yeah, so I think I think some species are more prone to it than others. Uh, whether there are certain conditions that encourage that, I'm not sure. It could be. Um, it could be that they do it when they colonise a new area because of lack of meat, but I don't know for sure if that happens. Okay. So our next question here from, oh, from Anonymous. How much time does it take for a worm to regenerate its tail? I think that depends on a few things. Um, I can't answer that definitively. Um, I think I think it varies by species. It will vary by how bad the damage is and it will vary yeah it will vary very on the health of the individual worm maybe the edge of the age of the worm what i've read is that as they get older so once they start getting older they get less able to do it but again this is something that will vary a lot between species some species will be much more prone to the the regeneration behavior than others mm. OK, I just see you've had quite a lot more questions come in. So unfortunately, you might not have time for all of them, but we'll do a few more at least. So here's one from Samantha. Why is too much sunlight bad for worms? Because they dry out. So earthworms, their natural, um, their natural reflex when they feel light is to, is to get away from it and get underground. And, and that's, it goes back to how they breathe. So, well, actually, it's probably two things. So, first of all, if they're out in the open in daylight, they're very vulnerable to predators. An, earth, uh, an earthworm is a tasty snack for many, many organisms. So, badgers, hedgehogs, foxes, birds of prey, garden birds, other invertebrates, many, many things eat earthworms. They're, they're really nutritious. So, and they're easy prey. They're easy prey. So, they don't want to be in the sunlight for that very reason to begin with. Secondly, if you've got the sun beaten down on you, it's going to dry you out. And if you breathe through your skin um, and the moisture, a moisture layer on your skin and you dry out, then you can't breathe. If you can't breathe, you can't move. Again, they'll die and they'll be even easier prey because they're less able to move. So, yeah, that's why light is not is not good for them. And you find that a lot of a lot of things that. A lot of organisms that breathe in that way, have a similar reflex to light. So wood lice, for example, there's a classic school experiment where you put them in a, a chamber where it's half dark, half light. And the second the wood louse gets into the light area, it will start moving around quite rapidly and speed up its behaviour until it gets back in the dark area. And that's because wood lice, like earthworms, actually breathe through a moisture layer. So they're very well adapted to living in dried conditions, but they have this moisture layer that, that they need to maintain um, to breathe. So yeah, similar thing. OK, so we'll do just a few more questions here. Um, which habitat has the highest diversity of earthworm species? Do you know what? That's a fantastic question. And I'm not sure we know the answer to it, but hopefully we will soon. So I'm actually working on the data that we've been gathering with um, two other members of the Earthworm Society, and we're going to look at the data compared to habitat and microhabitat. So in theory, a woodland should probably be best because it has lots of different niches. It has all of everything you need for those three different um, or for those four different ecological types. However, when I do soil pit sampling, I quite often find quite good diversity just in like an amenity grassland. So a football pitch, a mode, a mode grass area. And I can't answer why. And I haven't looked at it with any kind of statistical analysis to see if that's true. This is anecdotal. But so I think I think it's a very interesting question and I think we need to do more work on that. But it will depend on what you're looking for as well. You won't find water wet soil specialists, water loving species, unless you sample wet soils. You won't 
find FPGAs unless you unless you've got those FPGA habitats around. So yeah, a British garden, a normal British garden that's got a mixture of varied habitats is going to be fantastic for our farms, and you could get lots of different things there. I think my parents' garden up in Cumbria, it's it's over fifteen species. So that's actually half, over half of the species that you'll find in the British Isles. So yeah, we, we can get good diversity even in a garden. Mm. This question from an anonymous person. How many eggs do earthworms lay and what predates on them? Oh, I, I don't actually know what eats the cocoons. So what we've got to remember is that an earthworm um, egg is not laid as an egg. The egg is encased in that cocoon. Now that cocoon is like, it almost has like a leathery feel to it. Um, you, you will find the bigger ones for the bigger species in the soil when you're digging. There is little brown, um, browny yellow um, uh, structures that when you, you can kind of squeeze them and they feel like they're full of you know, like a liquid. So within one of those cocoons, um, you can get um, between um, one and 20 eggs. However, traditionally, you'll usually get one. Um, most species will just have one egg within a cocoon. Um, it, again, it will vary by species and it might, it might particularly vary by ecotype. So if we take, for example, the epigeic earthworms or the compost earthworms, um, these are things that might have a quicker life cycle than an anisic um, earthworm, which an anisic earthworm might see out certain unfavorable seasons like the winter, the summer by going um, and deep down and hibernating, whereas epigeic earthworms that live above ground and can't get away from those undesirable environmental conditions quite so well, they may, for example, uh, wait out that period in the cocoon stage. So they've got quite different behaviour, which means that there's going to be a bit of variation in the in the strategy they have, the reproductive strategy they have as well. So sorry, I can't give a definitive answer, but it's because there will be variation. Mm. Okay, well, can I call us today there with the questions? Thank you very much, Kieran. Sorry, everybody, if we didn't get enough time to get round to yours. So thank you very much, Kieran. I think we've all learned a lot about earthworms. As we've said, this talk is going to be going up onto YouTube and you can find it in many other ways. Um, just like to say thank you again to the Friends of Pollen Park for sponsoring this talk and all of our other online talks. You could join us again next Thursday for a talk on amphibians if you're interested. You can find us on Eventbrite to book tickets to that. So thank you very much for joining us, everybody. Thank you. Bye bye.